I'm Barb Blakely. I'm the director of ISU Com Foundation courses, English 150 and 250 here at Iowa State University. We're so pleased to see so many people this evening. In her book, Writing Matters, Rhetoric in Public and Private Lives, Professor Andrea Lunsford describes writing in a way that simultaneously reaches back to and honors rhetorical history and looks forward progressively to the 21st century when she says that writing is epistemic, performative, multivocal, and multimediated. Since 2000, Professor Lunsford has been the Louise Hewlett Nixon Professor of English and Director of the Program in Writing and Rhetoric at Stanford University. Prior to her Stanford appointment, Professor Lunsford was Distinguished Professor at The Ohio State University from 1986 to 2000, where she served as Vice Chair of the Department of English and as the Director of the Center for the Study and Teaching of Writing. From 1977 to 1986, Professor Lunsford was Associate Professor and Director of Writing at the University of British Columbia. She's currently a member of the Breadloaf School of English, in addition to being on the faculty at Stanford. Professor Lunsford received her BA and MA degrees from the University of Florida and her PhD from The Ohio State University. Professor Lunsford's scholarly interests are many. They include contemporary rhetorical theory, women and the history of rhetoric, collaboration and collaborative writing, current cultures of, of writing, intellectual property and composing, style and technologies of writing. She has written and co-authored 15 books, maybe more, I may not have counted correctly, <laughs> including The Everyday Writer, which we are proud to use in our ISUCOM Foundation courses, Essays on Classical Rhetoric and Modern Discourse, Singular Texts, Plural Authors, Reclaiming Rhetorica, Everything's an Argument, which is now in its fifth edition, and a brand new 2012 text, Everyone's an Author. In addition, Professor Lunsford has written numerous chapters and articles. Professor Lunsford has conducted workshops on writing and program reviews at dozens of North American universities. She has served as chair of the Conference on College Composition and Communication, as chair of the Modern Language Association Division on Writing, and is a member of the Modern Language Association Executive Council. To many of us in departments of English who teach rhetoric and writing, who have read her articles and books over the years and happily taught from her textbooks, Andrea Lunsford is quite simply a rock star. <laughs> we need to thank the following groups for their assistance with Professor Lunsford's visit, Bedford St. Martin's Press, the University Lectures Program, the Gold Trap Fund, and the Department of English, and prof especially Professor D Donna Nide for all of her organizational skills and getting everybody where they needed to be at the right time. Professor Len Lunsford's talk, as you can see, is titled Teaching Rhetoric in the Digital Age, What's Collaboration Got to Do With It? We invite you to join us for refreshments afterward. After she speaks, in, before refreshments, there, there will be a few, time for a few questions, and then we invite you to join us for refreshments. Please join me in welcoming Professor Andrea Lunsford. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, now I'm mic'd, so I don't think I need that. Can everybody hear me? So can, am I hearable? I also want to thank Donna and Barb and their colleagues um, for inviting me. I, I've had a, I've been here before, but I've never had so much uh, so much time with different groups as I've had today. It's been absolutely lovely, and I also want to to uh, say hello to my old and dear friend Neil Nakadate. I'm thank you for coming, and th and thanks to Scott so much for being with me and for Bedford St. Martin's for all they do for me. They can't hear you. They can't hear me. I can project or I can speak into this. You're I will okay? Speak. Yeah. Can you hear in the back? Yeah, those you you guys over there are way far away from me. 
How's that? Is that any better? Yes. Are you guys over back there? Okay, thanks. So I'm really pleased to be here. Um, tonight I am going to try to talk about 40 minutes. I want to leave time uh, for questions and answers, and I would love to talk with you, but I also am con very conscious that President Obama is speaking tonight a little after 9 o'clock, and I want for all of you to be able to go out in case you do want to, if you are in rhetoric, you, this is the most exciting time of four years. I've been glued to in MSNBC and Fox and CNN and flipping back and forth, and I watched as much of the Republican convention as I could, and now I'm deeply into the Democratic convention. So I'm going to try to be expeditious. Uh, that's what um, Garrison Keillor says about those biscuits that he advertised. My, they're expeditious. <laughs> I will try to be expeditious. Um, my first job after completing my dissertation, which was in 1977, was at the University of British Columbia, as Barb said, where I taught from 1977 to 87, 10 years. I taught a whole range of courses, but my favorites were writing and rhetoric courses that balanced reading and analyzing the work of others with producing work of our own. I'm, I'm, we'll say that my classes at British Columbia at the time was following the British system, and my classes were year long. Now think of that, you guys, on the, on the semester system and me on the quarter system. So when I had a writing and rhetoric class, it was divided into two semesters, but we went together, we were together all year long, and that was a, quite a privilege. So I set these classes up, they were small classes, 20 max, in workshop style, dividing the students into peer review groups, and throughout the term, the students read and critiqued each other's work six ways to Sunday. I learned a bit on the history and theory of both writing and rhetoric. Um, I lectured a bit. I don't like to lecture it in spite of what I'm doing right now. So I never in my classes, the most I might lecture is five or, you know, seven or eight minutes. Um, and I led increasingly lively discussions and debates as the students got to know one another and loosened up. At the end of every single term in the student evaluation form, I asked the students one question. What was the most important and effective element of this class. What did you like best? I was always secretly hoping that the students would say, you, 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 Andrea, you are the most important part of this class. We wouldn't have been the class without you. Did they ever once say that in 10 years? No, they never once said that in 10 years. They said, what's the best part of this class? My peer group always unanimously for 10 years. So I might be a slow learner, but after about three years, I started to catch on. That this was said, they were, my students were giving me a message. Well, I might be accused of other things besides being a slow learner, but I have learned, I learned a long time ago to listen to students. That what they have to say, I have learned more about how to improve my teaching and how to improve my craft from my students than they will ever know. So I right away started thinking, when they talk, I listen. When they write, I read. So I began to take note of this unanimous response. What I found is that most of my students had little, if any, time to work together or with any other students at all. In the fast and hectic pace of their college lives, they simply plunged from one individual assignment to the next, hoping for the best. And this is true at Stanford, where the students are driven. They, are, they drive themselves, and we, where they're always saying, I'm going on to the next big thing. Um, they just reel from assignment to assignment, never having time to reflect unless they are given an opportunity, as they can be in a good writing class. Well, this insight that, come, that came to me from my students led me to study collaboration and its relationship to teaching and learning and writing, and to begin writing and uh, collaborating myself in writing. Now, I want to just give a little moment of shameless self-promotion about these two, <laughs> two books of mine and my friend and co-author, Lisa Ede. So now Lisa and I have finished two books on collaboration spanning, the, this, this work spans 30 year period of writing together. And that, boy, we're still friends and that's a mark of how effective collaboration can be in the right circumstances. So over these 30 years, Lisa and I have written numerous articles and, and uh, as, as well as these two books. And in my teaching, I've tried to walk the walk as well as talk the talk about collaboration. 
Certainly, I have been a major advocate of collaborative learning and collaborative practices for my entire career, though I am very sad to say that my advocacy has failed to make much change, especially in the humanities departments I have always been part of. Um, still, uh, when your professors come up for tenure and promotion, they are judged on their single scholarship. And that's a universal. When students write dissertations, they must be single, even though they're always collaborative. If they're worth anything, they're, they're collaborative. So change is happening. My grandmother, who uh, lived in the hills of Tennessee, lived to be 96, um, and had said all these strange things, I, what I thought were common at the time, she'd say, um, we, got a, we got a frog strangler coming, by which she meant that it was going to rain hard. And she called the cupboards um, in the kitchen the upper division. <laughs> anyway, she had a lot of sayings. And one of them, uh, when I would say, oh, Granny, when are we going to do this? She would say, Andrea, slowly but slowly. And that's how it has been with change in the academy, slowly but slowly. Although I'm not giving up because, of course, we entered the digital age. And with it, what I've called the biggest literacy revolution the world has seen in 2,500 years. And you students in here are in the midst of this literacy revolution. In fact, as I soon discovered, seemingly simple terms like reading and writing were more and more difficult to pin down. In the digital age, audiences can and do often become collaborators. Indeed, there's hardly any way to, any way to avoid doing so. And in this scene, students are composing verbal and visual texts like wove, short films, audio essays, other kinds of uh, texts more than ever before. They are also writing more than ever before in the history, I think, in the history of the world. They are also writing in sites unimaginable, even a couple of decades ago. Email, for example, is often now described by my students as that's what you do when you want to get in touch with a teacher because their writing has moved from email into social media spaces. Um, then there's the spectacular growth of social networking sites which began in earnest with sixdegrees.com in 1997, hit the mainstream in 2003 with MySpace and was followed by Facebook in 2004, YouTube in 2005, Twitter in 2006, Tumblr in 2007, and more recently, things like Google Plus. I could show you that if I had sense. Um, this is astonishing. It, the, the way that, that these uh, sites of writing have changed communicative possibilities and opportunities for writers is ground shaking, earth shattering. The opportunities that you have now through these spaces. Add to these venues the staggering array of writing sites involved with fanzines, linked systems, blogs, wikis, and the accessibility of mountains of information to be sampled, shared, and used in the, di in the design of new texts. And we see something of the huge digital canvas in and on which students are crafting and responding to messages today. In such a setting, Students are more and more used to thinking of themselves as part of a network of people engaged in various discursive practices rather than as individual authors, at least when they are at work on self-sponsored activities. As researchers Michelle Noble and Colin Langshire point out, students today embody what they call the new literacies. And this is kind of fancy language, but I especially don't like cyber spatial post-industrial mindset, which I can hardly say, but I know what they mean. Um, that's not me. That's not how I was brought I was brought up in what they call the post, um, um, the post industrial, uh, the, the industrial mindset uh, of production and consumption, not this new mindset. New literacies, according to them, are collaborative, thoroughly collaborative, and they are distributed across wide spans of space and time. They are participatory and performative. And I want to stop a minute to, uh, to gloss this a little bit. Um, I said earlier today that I think if I had to say in a nutshell what has changed in the last 25 years about communication, I would say that in the, in the academy and in the society at large that we've seen a shift from um, focus on and valuing of reading to a focus on and valuing of writing. We have gone from an age that privileged the consumption of texts 
soaking up the best knowledge that you could find to a, a time when what is valued is the production of text. And this is a huge watershed moment in the history of literacy. Um, so the, the new literacies, they say, are less expert-centered. I mean, you don't have to be an expert to go on Facebook and write what you want to write. You don't have to be an expert to keep a blog. Or you can become an expert online with putting in the hours that, um, what's his name? Um, not Jonathan Franz, but uh, um, come on. One, 10,000, uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Thank you, Andrea. That he says you have to put in 10,000 hours to become an expert. Well, you can do that. And you can, anybody can really do that. And finally, new literacies, uh, students uh, today, writers today, are not bound by traditional notions of intellectual property. They're more interested in remixing, in mashups, in taking things apart and sampling those kinds of activities that are showing up in writing more and more, and which I think are very exciting. So in addition to widespread collaboration, these literacies have been deeply encouraged by Web 2.0. And they involve a different kind of mindset than literacies traditionally associated with traditional print literacy, which is what I grew up with and anybody older than, what, like, what, 40 uh, probably grew up with. In their introduction to a new literacy sample, Noble and Langshear con contrast what they refer to as the cyberspatial uh, literacy to the kind of literacy I grew up with. Um, and people my age, they say, whose experience grounds them primarily in a physical industrial mindset, we tend to see the individual person as the unit of production, competence, and intelligence the individual person. And our universities are founded on that assumption, that it's the individual. The individual GPA, the individual work, is what counts. And everything about the new literacies is challenging that assumption. And the, it's going to be a big um, step that universities are going to have to take to change that, to broaden that assumption, to include other forms of, um, of creating knowledge. The language, as I've said, of Colin, uh, of, um, Colin and Michelle is pr fairly um, dense. But for me, the changes I've been describing can be summed up in this one dramatic shift that I just talked about, the move from consumption to production. And I, th I want you to try to remember, if you remember anything about uh, from this lecture, try to remember that. Um, when up until about 25 years ago, the cultural capital in universities had, was all about taking in information from books. Now, students especially are saying, okay, that's all right, we got information everywhere. We can take in information at the drop of a hat. What we want to do is produce knowledge. We want to make knowledge ourselves. We want to get out there and do it. And that is a huge change. So that is to say we're seeing a swing in cultural capital from learning as largely passive passive consumption, soaking up things, to learning as doing, active production, both of knowledge and of texts. Few things better exemplify this new sense of textual interaction, collaboration, shared ownership and production than Wikipedia, which it's hard to remember has been around only since 2001. With nearly 20 million articles in 182 languages and growing exponentially, Wikipedia offers limitless opportunities for collaboration, for participation and performance, as contributors are simultaneously co-authors and the audiences for what they write. So that's a perfect example of when a writer becomes an moves back and forth between the role of writer, producer of knowledge, and reader, consumer of knowledge. My students not only consult Wikipedia, many of them contribute to it, but students also engage in other kinds of online collaborative participatory distributed projects. In Convergence Culture, for instance, Henry Jenkins, who's the former director of MIT's uh, Comparative Media Studies program, notes that more than 60% of the content for the video game The Sims was gener generated by its fans. More than 60% was created by the users, the, con the consumers, who then became the producers. And that's just very cool, I think. 
In his study, Jenkins points to many examples of fans playing central roles in what he refers to as transmedia storytelling. One example involves players who work together as a group called the Cloud Makers to play The Beast, a video game created to promote Steven Spielberg's 2001 film, Artificial AI. According to Jenkins, the number of players who participated in the Cloud Makers collaborative effort ranged from 500 to more than 7,500. This collaboration engaged not only those working together to play the game, but the game designers as well, since the designers often reacted to players in real time. As Tom, one of the players, said to Professor Jenkins, as the cloud makers got better and better at solving their puzzles, those designers had to come up with harder and harder puzzles. They were responding to stuff we were saying or doing. To be sure, much of the collaborative online writing that students are so keen to do is self-sponsored. We're still not assigning this kind of writing very much in colleges today. So writing, writing that they're doing outside of class or maybe writing that we might think of as for entertainment is where all of this new, these new literacies are coming to play, um, but not always. Some of you may know about a uh, young woman in England, Heather Lawyers, uh, collaborative Hogwarts newspaper called the Daily Prophet. Now, this young homeschooled teenager at the age of 14 launched this journal, a web-based school newspaper for Harry Potter's fictional Hogwarts. Before anyone could say Quidditch, the newspaper had a staff of 102 kids from around the world. More importantly, when Heather's and other sites devoted to the Potter series were threatened by Warner Brothers, who came and said, we're shutting you down, you do not have the right to use the name Daily Prophet. Heather formed an association called Defense Against the Dark Arts <laughs> and worked with fans throughout the world to protect their freedom to publish fan fiction online, and they won. So there's just a perfect example of writers taking matters into their own hands and becoming the producers of knowledge themselves. The examples of Tom the Cloudmaker and Heather emphasize the gap that currently exists between the highly collaborative, participatory, productive, self-sponsored online writing that many students do and the writing they're asked to do when they enter many of their college classes. From one perspective, this gap is hardly new. A gap has always existed between the values, expectations, interests, and experiences students bring to the academy and the values, expectations, interests, and experiences of their teachers. Someone in the, a session earlier today was, was saying that more and more that gap is noticeable, that what I'm expecting, what I know and value is not what my students expect, know, and value, and that's a challenge for all teachers today. This gap seems especially wide today. Students out of class are composing across a range of multimodal genres, most often in concert with other people. Yet in the majority of their college classes, they are still the individual learner, the single author that I described, that Lisa and I tried to describe over 30 years ago, and critique. Today, however, others are calling attention to this discrepancy, arguing that we must move beyond the single author and the printed page and allow students to engage fully with what Aristotle called all the available means of persuasion. And today, many of those means of persuasion are digital. In the words of researcher Cynthia Self, students today need a full quiver of semiotic modes from which to select role models who can teach them to think critically about a range of communication tools and multiple ways of reaching audiences. That just sums up what I think we need today. It goes without saying that these goals all call for collaboration. I've been talking fairly generally, and I'd like to pause now to take a look at the work of a couple of Stanford students who seem to me definitely to inhabit the cyberspatial post-industrial mindset. Now here is a young woman named Sparker Two. She, her name is Stephanie Parker, who is an avid contributor to Twitter. She tweets with a purpose, whether it's to get some information or to give information from those who follow her. In fact, Stephanie is an avid fan of Korean cinema and tweets every day or two with what amount to 144 characters, character reviews. 
little teeny tiny mini reviews. Her writing is participatory, it is performative, it's collaborative, it's aimed at action. She's engaging readers and they go on then to create a discourse of their own about whatever Korean cinema she has found to watch and report on to them. For another example, take a look at an advertisement produced by students taking Stanford's second required writing course. Not content with doing the course assignments, which were certainly hefty enough and in some ways match up to those in your 150 class, these students set out to use the skills they were learning in their class, which was a class on the rhetoric of advertisement, to create ads of their own. Ads that would in turn parody their course. So here, they, here we have them saying, some people say they would rather die than speak in front of a group. So that means that, and you can't read this, but it says, I can't read it either, but it says something like, that means that um, you would rather, if you were um, at a funeral, you'd rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy, which is something from Seinfeld. So these students just in their, on their own time went off. They were sick of analyzing the advertisements their teacher was bringing in, and they said, let's see what we can do. And five groups formed, and they did five parodic ads of their own class, um, and they were, they were really funny and really successful. So they just used their laptops and they used, made use of software programs like Photoshop. They were producing discourse, not consuming the discourse of others. And they were certainly practicing new literacies. That is, literacies that are, you can practically know this by heart now, participatory, collaborative, performative. Note that, uh, I also should note that these students do not blink at using photos they take from the web, a practice that is raising many questions about and challenges to traditional notions of copyright. You know, there's a copy left movement that is resistant, highly resistant to traditional copyright. Just a couple of other quick examples. Um, here is a website designed by a Stanford student and her colleagues in the Stanford Labor Action Coalition, a group that advocated for a living wage for temporary campus workers. Now, you don't know the Stanford campus, but see there's this brown fist squeezing this tower. That's the right wing think tank, the Hoover Institution. And uh, these, uh, this website and all the signs are in Spanish, which my, which my student wrote. Um, this caused a tremendous stir on campus, and I was saying earlier today, this group forced the um, uh, administration to raise uh, temporary workers' salary twice in the four years that Anna was in school. And she, this is what she was committing herself to. She was doing her assignments. Probably most of you students are doing your assignments as well. But what her, where her heart was was in this. This was the writing that she cared about. This was writing that she said and others said makes something happen in the world. And I could um, offer a lot of other examples from short films to digital collages, audio essays, and all manner of mashups and remixes. But I think I've made my point. Literacy is changing in swift and significant ways. And those changes offer challenges as well as opportunities for us teachers in the digital age. Now, I want to talk about, I think, four challenges and then ask you what you would like to talk about. The first challenge I see is to higher education and the Western world's deeply individualistic system that rewards individuals through a system of individual grades and points that values the individual GPA. I think I've got that on the slide. To say the least, working collaboratively runs counter to this ideology which is deeply embedded, as I've said, in all of our academic institutions. I don't think we can or should abandon an emphasis on the individual. Individuals count. We, we, our interiority is very important to us. But I think we must learn to temper it, to temper what I call American hyper-individualism. You know, the, um, the idea, who was John Stewart said the other night, that every candidate for office wants to believe that he was or she was born in a log cabin that he built himself. That's, that's that hyper-individualism that I think we have to give up. We see calls for a move in this direction everywhere. A recent Atlantic um, uh, magazine, for instance, featured an article by Richard Florida on the relationship between sociality and progress. He concludes by saying this, today's students need a stronger focus on teamwork, 
persuasion, and entrepreneurship, a better integration of liberal arts with technological literacy, and an emphasis on social intelligence that makes for creative collaboration and leadership. Couldn't have said it better myself. To respond to Florida's call, teachers must do more than assign collaborative projects. That's not a bad start, but we have to do more than that. We need to provide a strong theoretical rationale for such projects, along with data to support it, and that's out there. There's a mountain of research to show that collaborative learning and collaborative writing work better, teach more, last longer than hyper-radically individualistic forms of learning. In addition, we need to craft collaborative projects that will work hard to engage every student in the group and guide the group in analyzing their work together from beginning to end, as well as the product that that work produces. When students graduate, in most professions they go into, jobs they go into, they are going to be working as part of a team. And it is our job to get them to think hard about what that means, uh, really hard. A second challenge that we're just beginning to grapple with, I think, is the ongoing notion of our classrooms as private spaces. And I think you at Iowa State have gone a long way toward challenging this assumption. In the digital age, these spaces are irrevocably public. Here's an example of what I mean. Imagine this. A student in an undergraduate course, a writing course, composed a research-based argument and then presented an oral version of that argument as part of a panel at an in-class conference held at the end of term. Did the, this was the kind of repurposing assignment that you do in your 250 class, I think. The teacher of the class created a website and posted all of the student arguments on it, inviting response from the students as well as from other audiences. Two years later, the teacher got a response from an angry professor at another university pointing out that one student's argument drew on this professor's work, citing it, but in at least one important instance, failing to enclose a directly quoted passage within quotation marks. Now here's a professor at a completely different university, some gets on this website and has a little fit. The professor demands that the student's argument be taken off the website, accusing the student of sloppy habits at best and plagiarism at worst. Notified of this turn of events, the student, now a prospective graduating senior, is com was completely surprised and taken aback. He had, not, had no intention to plagiarize. He certainly had not imagined that one of his sources would go to the trouble of accessing his essay, and neither had his teacher. Well, we got to stop thinking that way because our work is accessible and it's public. Like many others, this student experiences the internet and many of its sites as fairly private, when the reality is that audiences are there all the time, browsing, searching, engaging, responding, sometimes accusing, like this professor. Many scholars and commentators have noted the breakdown between private and public today and on the somewhat contradictory attitudes students hold. Students often say they are comfortable being in public, that a public stance comes with the territory of digital communication. So I put all that stuff on Facebook, that's fine, I, want, I don't care if everybody sees it. They hold that attitude, but they sometimes view, uh, view sites, and especially social networking sites like Facebook, as relatively private away from the prying eyes of parents and other un unwanted audiences, and you can protect, protect a Facebook page to some degree, but um, Facebook has got a lot more control than we might think. Why hide, students say, when you can perform? But even if young people are performing, many are clueless about the size and diversity of the audiences that they are reaching. Clearly, even though many of our students are completely at ease in the digital landscape, we need to help them become more knowledgeable about the nature and complexity of the audiences for whom they perform, particularly as they shift back and forth from self-sponsored online writing to academic writing. As teachers, then, we have some responsibility for unpacking the concept of audience, since, as this example suggests, the teacher is not the sole audience in a digital world. Beyond unpack, and I, I want to I pause here, just want to give one other example. A young man that I've just finished writing a case study of, a, a, a young man named Mark, African American from Los Angeles, founded the Stanford Spoken Word Collective with a law student in his first year at Stanford. He went on to double major in English with a poetry emphasis and um, computer science with a minor in um, 
ethnic studies. So he was a pretty interesting, interesting kid, and he built a beautiful website for himself, really gorgeous. And he put up a lot of his poetry, including a poem that he had performed in many venues, and it, um, it's about um, a young African-American men playing basketball and attempting to to establish an identity in a ring, and the basketball court is ringed with um, like barbed wire, you know, it's a trap, they're trapped in there in a way they're playing basketball, they're playing basketball, they're trying to establish an identity when everything in the outside world is, is attempting to destroy that identity. Well, this poem is entitled, I'm Dat Nigga, and it, that was on Mark's website, and it, it's, a, it's a very powerful and very beautiful poem. But a potential investor in his startup company looked at that poem and wrote to him, and said, I think this is very unprofessional, and I challenge you. And that really made Mark sit back and think about just how public he wanted to be and what of his work he wanted to put out there. Made him think a lot more seriously about it than it ever had before. He stuck with the value of that poem, um, but he had to learn to defend it to an audience he'd never encountered before because he was used, used to connecting with the Stanford audience. And now he had this big, massive, unknown audience. Let's see, well, I shouldn't have taken um, So I, I think that what the example of the student who unconsciously left off a quotation mark and Mark, who was challenged to take down a poem that, that he was very proud of, I think that we need to find spaces for our students to examine these issues. These are hard. These are tough, tough personal issues as well as academic and professional issues about the persona we are going to project on a digital landscape and the person that we want to be online and off. So I think that students should examine these issues and they can do it. Uh, they can begin simply by looking carefully at uh, websites uh, the, for instance, have any of you seen the pro Anna, the pro anorexia websites? So, what? How would you describe them in a word? Disturbing. Anything else? Horrifying. Deceptive. They're all they're all photoshopped within an inch of their lives. So students start looking at things like that, and they start getting. A, a sense of how important analysis is to their ability to understand what is being given to them all the time. That I can't get that. I, I wish I had never gone to with my students to investigate those sites. I can't get them out of my mind now. So a third challenge that I want to pose is figuring out how students learn best and questioning the university's reliance on the lecture mode. And here I am standing lecturing. You should all just throw rotten tomatoes at me. We know that students have varying learning styles. Many of our students, many of us, are visual learners. More important, increasing evidence shows that all of us, but especially young people today, learn best by doing, by producing, by participating, rather than by sitting passively and taking in what somebody else is saying. I have colleagues and wonderful colleagues who give wonderful lectures and who love more than anything in the whole world to hear the sound of their own voices. <laughs> and some of them are absolutely mesmerizing. But what I know is that's all about what the teacher is doing. That's not about what the students are doing. And the, and the teacher is performing and the students are doing nothing. And in fact, most of what they get out of that lecture will be gone before the test even comes up. So I've mentioned the shift from consumption to production before, but now I want to tease out one of the strongest implications for us as teachers. It's looking more and more like, as I've said, the lecture is not the best format for teaching. Last spring, our vice provost of undergraduate education, a drama professor and a dear friend, Harry Elam, gave a wonderful lecture exploring the question, is the lecture dead? In it, he didn't carry out a post-mortem, but he did suggest that the lecture is under attack from many sources. As one researcher puts it, with modern technology, if all there is is lectures, we don't need the faculty to do it. Get them to do it once, put it on the web, and then fire all the faculty. 
Now that's an ex, you know, extreme position, but it makes a point. So the, that, that person who said that's being facetious, but facetious with a purpose. His point is that in the digital age, the purpose have, of teaching has shifted from the lecture as a means of giving information. Note what I said earlier. Information's not the problem anymore. We are drowning in information. We don't need uh, somebody to be giving us information only. We need to help students understand the information, to sort it out, to learn how to discriminate, to learn how to prioritize. And that's a big shift in the teacher position. Over 20 years ago, researchers at Berkeley, concerned about the disproportionate failure of African-American students in math classes, carried out a series of studies that concluded that these students were trying very, very hard to learn the material by attending the lec every lecture and studying on their own. And they were studying hard, but it was not working. When they put these students into learning groups and asked them to teach one another, they turned this trend around. More recently, and I mean, that was a, a, a very dramatic, it was all like covered in all the media about this uh, study at Berkeley. It was really astonishing. Um, more recently, Harvard physics prof Eric Mazur and his colleagues came to a similar conclusion based on their observation that while their students were passing their courses, they were not getting the concepts. At first, Professor Mazur did what most anybody would do. He tried to give better lectures. He tried really hard to give better lectures. He gave what he th thought on this one day was a thorough, thoughtful, memorable blockbuster of a lecture. And in it, he tried to explain a particular concept in physics. He said, I thought I had nailed it. It was the best explanation one could possibly give to this question. The trouble was, when he asked the students if they had any questions, not a single one did. And then when he gave a quick checkup problem, he realized that 65% of the class had not gotten the concept at all. 65%, and this is at Harvard. Mazur says he simply didn't know what to do. So he just said, he, he said he was just speechless. So he said, okay, how about discussing that question with each other? And then he said, something happened in my classroom that I had never seen before. The entire classroom emerged in chaos. They were dying to explain it to one another and to ask questions about it. This experience led Professor Mazur to give up lecturing in favor of what he and his colleagues call peer instruction. And rather than teaching by telling, he teaches by questioning and by letting the students work together to solve the class, the problems. In doing so, he's addressing the participatory, collaborative, productive nature of the new literacies and asking students to be active producers of knowledge. He still teaches very big classes, but with his graduate students, they have everybody send in um, um, questions based on the reading, so they have to do the reading ahead of time, and then they work on those questions in class. And he says it's transformed his teaching. Moreover, it's transformed the learning of the students. Now they do get it. Harvard was always graduating students with A's in physics. They were always going on to graduate school and doing very well. But those were the really they were those were the students who could teach themselves the physics. It was the other students that couldn't do any of that that he found he was reaching. So our fourth, and I think our final challenge, is learning how to retain the, and value the best of the old literacies with the best of the new. And especially I would uh, think about the, uh, the, uh, how to balance the old literacies with the best of the new media texts that our students are producing. The question of whether and how to assign and teach new media assignments is a vexing one for many teachers. In a collection of essays called Writing New Media, which paints a rich picture of the kinds of writing students are increasingly doing today, both inside and outside the classroom, Cindy Self points out the double-edged sword that comes along with the new media texts. As she tells the story of David, a young man who teaches himself to produce, I mean teaches himself, to produce very successful and effective new media texts, like websites, only to fail his college classes because of his inability to create acceptable traditional print texts. This is a, it is a heartbreaking story that she tells. The point self makes is one that rings especially true to me. How can I retain the best of what they're, what they're calling here acceptable traditional print texts? How can I retain that while allowing students like David, to embrace the best of the new. 
In short, it seems to me that now my goal must be to help students acquire a repertoire of styles and strategies that can help them deliver their messages in the medium and form appropriate for a particular purpose and audience. And that's a tall task. That said, I've seen other professors asking students to work with new media to learn and perform better. Recently, I saw a presentation given by a professor of German, this was down at Texas Christian, who had been persistently disappointed by her students' progress in learning German. With the help of the Technology Support Office and the Writing Center at that university, she asked her students to stop writing essays in German, <gasps> heresy, and instead to write and produce a video on some aspect of German culture. The students had to decide on what aspect to focus on, do some research on it, figure out a way to capture what they wanted to say in images, and write and deliver a voiceover for the video. At first, students were wary of this assignment. It sounded like a trick of some kind to them. But when they're, well, what do you think happened? Thousands of times better. Thousands. When their performance on exams and their comprehension and production of German skyrocketed, they became true believers and so did their teacher. Now I imagine that most people here have experienced the four challenges I've described, whether you're a teacher or a student, and that you have met them in ingenious and effective ways. One thing seems clear to me. We are living and teaching in a digital age, and each challenge we face opens up opportunities for us to expand our own repertoires, to join our students as learners, and to engage in the kind of highly participatory, distributed, and performative practices that are characteristic of this age. Not to put a too fine a point on it, Collaboration has everything to do with it. And I want you to go off and say that over and over again. Collaboration has everything to do with it. You heard it here, and thank you for paying attention for this long time. I want to stop, uh, pause now and stop to see what you would like to talk about, whether you want to go back to any of the points I've raised or whether you'd like to raise some new issues that students and teachers are facing in the digital age. So who has something to say? Yes, please. I can't see who that is. Oh, hi, Barbara. <laughs> uh, On the curve. <laughs> <laughs> could, could you how, uh, like yeah. Yeah, I absolutely could. Um, yeah, good night, guys. Thanks for, thanks for coming. If you have to go, please, please uh, feel free to go. Yeah, at Stanford, we, um, we spent three years um, in summer institutes on our own time doing these kind of multimodal assignments and arguing about them and looking at them and taking them apart and putting them back together again and trying to create a rub some rubrics that we could use. And the, we then shared them with the students. And every year we come back to those and modify them in various ways as we learn more about what constitutes a really stellar oral presentation or what constitutes a really brilliant use of multimedia or a, a really brilliant video. This is a huge challenge, but my, my students tend to think English teachers just make up the grades anyway. So they're just, they're just making them up on these new texts as well as on the old. That's not true, um, although there is an, ele an important element of subjectivity in all grading, I think, and especially in English grading. But I think we can dispel that notion by getting the students to, under to help us understand what makes something excellent and then using that those criteria to judge our own performances. So thank you, Barbara. That's a really great question. Yes, please. Yeah, well, they already are. I mean, how many of you know a middle schooler who doesn't know how to use PowerPoint and Prezi? you know, how to make a video, they're all out there. My, my five-year-old grandniece made a video last week. I mean, it was crude. <laughs> and I learned what she was up to when she said, Aunt A, burp into the microphone. <laughs> I said, Lila, what are you doing? Make a video. 
So um, I think that sometimes middle schools are, and high schools are ahead of us in this game. Um, but we, we need to support what they're doing, and we need to, and when we get our incoming frosh, we need to ask them what kind of experiences they've had in high school. But this stuff is out there all across the country um, in more affluent schools than less affluent schools, for sure. Again, the gap between the haves and the have-nots in terms of education in the United States is still very, very large. Yes? Yeah. Can you put them in groups and let them teach each other? They probably know. Yeah, that's the very first thing I would do, and and ask them to be. And I get, I want to get all their email addresses, all their Facebook, their Twitter handles and whatnot, and share those with their group so that they can contact each other out of class and say, "Man, I cannot make this work." And the students will, they will step up, and they're pretty darn good teachers. So one of my students said, of, make me so mad a few weeks ago, or no, it was in the spring. I said, have you been to the writing center lately? He said, I used to go to the writing center, but then I thought, Erin Krampitz is right down the hall. She knows more than, and he said, they, kids seek out the people who know more than they do. So that's the very first thing I would do. But um, I'm really concerned about students in community colleges who are working one or two jobs, who have families, who have obligations. They don't have a ton of outside class time. So I think you do need to do what you're doing to make some space for this to happen in class because I don't see how they can get to it. And they're, they're not at a residential campus like Iowa State. They're living all over the place. But, but, you know, look what you're giving them once you introduce this to them. It's giving them a set of skills that will, that will be important for the rest of their lives. So it's worth it, it's worth it I think. But let them teach each other. Probably find out that those really whiz kids guys know a lot more than you do anyway. That's always my experience. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. I was just wondering if you use any social media sites yourself. I am on Facebook. I am on Twitter. Um, I have a Flickr account, although I very seldom use it. I have a blog. I have a blog on my website, and I have a blog at my publisher's website called Teacher to Teacher. Um, so I am. Um, I don't, it's not natural to me, and I have to be prodded. I have to get six messages that says somebody wants to be friends before I will go back and check my Facebook page. In, in other words, I don't live on Facebook the way younger people do. But yeah, I, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm not very good at Twitter, I can tell you that. I mean, talk about learning to be succinct. <laughs> you know, in the medieval period, Erasmus wrote this book called Decopia that was all about how to elaborate, how to take an idea and spin it out in 189 different ways. I, I think it's that book where he has the salutation, um, thank you for your uh, letter, and he writes it in 100 different ways under different styles and there's a wonderful uh, artist that mimicked that in a picture book so how to take one little storyline and represent it in a hundred different ways in pictures in comics form so that was the mid medieval period and we learned a lot from decopia from learning to elaborate and make things deeper and richer and longer now we're learning a lot from Twitter about how to make things succinct and shorter and better so, you know, you see a, a tweet that you really admire, write it down and send it to me. We should have a little con. You know the haiku, haiku uh, Twitter contest. I, I just came back from a, going on a semester at Sea Voyage or where I went around the world, and I did, there were 36 so-called dependent children on the boat. So they were the kids of uh, faculty and staff. And so I, I had a, a kids' writers' club once a week for two or three hours and we did all kinds of things and one day we did haikus and they didn't know what those were and I told them about the syllables and they were all counting on their fingers and here was the here was one of my favorite haikus a little boy named Rufus um, I love tater tots tater tots are potatoes 
in a weird disguise. <laughs> Is that he's five years old. Counting, you know, helping. I had to help him write it out. We also did joke day, and I can't remember a lot of the jokes, but this one, a, a kid named Ibeck, this was his joke. Um, why did the spider cross the road? Get to a new website. <laughs> he was six. So, I mean, I think we're, we're seeing the kids coming up with a lot of these skills. They, they won't know the analytical part. They won't know how to analyze what they're doing, but they know how to, how to do it. Yeah, anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but not every student is going to have that urge to ask for the type writing. And you might have a student who does a uh, Twitter movie review or something like that. So, how do you shape assignments then to fit the needs of all these different right. student interests? That yeah, them yeah I, I can tell you that our assignments are pretty broad. Um, in our first course, we begin with rhetorical analysis. Our courses have a theme. Like, I teach a course where the theme is graphic memoir. And that's what we're kind of studying. The students are trying to produce them on their own. And they have to do some research, anything having to do with graphic memoir. And since they have elected themselves into that class, that's something they're all interested in. Our course arcs toward a final research-based argument, which is then presented, repurposed, as you say, and presented in some other form. And the topics are completely open. Now, that is a blessing to students and also a curse if they can't come up with a topic. And we're on 10-week quarters. You've got to get that topic, and you've got to get out the gate right away. So that means I spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time or small group time with students trying to pull out of them their own interests and their own knowledge base and try to help them select a topic that they are going to want to make something happen in the world about. You know, it doesn't have to be some big activist uh, cause like uh, getting a higher wage for temporary workers. It can be something in a community organization. It can be something in your family. It can, it can, but it means something. You know, it, has, it takes some action. It's a performance of some kind. So those are a couple of ideas. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Who's being the teacher? Yeah. We talked about that a little bit early, a little earlier today. Uh, one, I'd say just two or three quick things. The first is to help them understand what you know about collaboration. What I've said tonight, that if you want to learn. This is one of the best ways possible, and there is a ton of research to prove it. I'm not making this up. It's not, I'm not doing this because I don't have anything better to do. This is going to help you learn. It will help you improve your grades, and it will help you um, get inside the discipline, whatever the discipline is that you're trying to get into uh, better and more effectively. Now, so after I try to give a pep talk and, and give some research to ground it, then I um, don't let students self-select into groups. We number off, and I like groups of three, so I usually have five groups of three in my smaller classes, and we just go one, two, three, one, two, three, and I do it on the first day of class so nobody's sitting with anybody. They don't know who each other. They don't know each other, and those are our groups, and the first assignment is to get to know your group and to report to me on what you learned about your group, and then my students also give um, at least once a week and sometimes twice a little report to me individually written about what they contributed to the group what every other member of the group contributed what problems they had run into and what that student was going to do to correct the problems and as I said earlier the first time I do that every single member of the group says I'm doing all the work <laughs> so I can just take that to them and say you know you're not, all of you are not doing all the work. Some, so there's this misconceptions. You know, we all want to see ourselves as the star of the show, in other words. I also allow students to expel somebody from a group because they're going to get a group grade. And if there's somebody who's really dragging, then they have to just get out and do a project on their own. Or if there are two or three of them, put them together and let them, let the expelled, 
you know, do whatever they want to do. And finally, um, I negotiate the grade, uh, the grade with them after I've had all this input from them about what they're doing and how they're solving their problems. And it's a pretty rigorous um, system, but I think it gets them invested enough to really work and to be part of the collaborative group. So those are just a few things. All right, are we worn out? Every, Neil's worn out, that means we're all, okay, last, <laughs> the, the last word goes to you, yes. Oh my like god. Now, but I have two granddaughters that are college students and frequently I've heard, well, we've got this group, there's four of us or something and, and you know, two of them we never can get a hold of them, they never can meet with us, they never can do anything. And so we're just going ahead and doing this because we have to get our grade and we're not gonna squeal on them, so you know Yeah. So you gotta force their hands it's good that you're in that way. I think students today are often very resistant to group work, and why is that? What did you say, Bar Barbara? Bar because of the hyper-individualism, thinking nobody else can help me, I can't help anybody else, I just got to do this on my own. And also because they have had some bad experiences. I mean, I've been in some groups, faculty groups, where I would, I would sign anything to get out of the group. You know, you want us, uh, you want us to no chairs in the classroom? Fine. I mean, I would just, you dumb it down to the lowest common denominator. So we've all been in those situations. So that's, that's why it's worthwhile explaining to students what the collaborative process can be. Because they're in charge of this. Take control. Don't let it be that way. So I say that to myself sometimes when I'm on, especially those great big committees where everybody's divided into subgroups and it can get really ugly. But yeah, so I, I take your point. Well, I want to thank you for coming out tonight and for attending to this uh, kind of a harangue, sort of a <laughs> sermon according to the, the, the scripture as delivered by Andrea Lunsford. So, and please um, take that with a grain of salt. I, I do continue to learn and often to learn how little I know. So thank you for helping me learn more as I've been here today. And now we will adjourn, right? Okay, we, we're adjourning. <laughs>